What's up, guys? Welcome to another edition of Before the Whistle presented by BRK Insurance Group. If your business is looking for the best in employee benefits, commercial property and casualty insurance, or retirement and 401k plan services, there's no one better suited to meet your challenges or build a plan centered around your needs than BRK Insurance Group. What's up, y'all? Welcome back again to Before the Whistle. I'm your host, Maddie Hudak, and I'm dropping this episode uh, on our Tuesday schedule again, just because I was able to have some Saturday activity with Tulane holding their first scrimmage of spring camp, if you will. Uh, so the way I'm going to do it this week, I've been having guests on for the last couple of weeks. My episode with Lawrence Keyes dropped this past Saturday. I've really enjoyed doing those with those guys, but there's only a couple practices left in spring camp. And the way it's probably looking moving forward is we're going to have these Saturday scrimmages that I think are going to illuminate a lot of information that I'll then track that following week and give that, that kind of spring camp update separate of that. All of that spiel to say, we're here to break down Saturday scrimmage today. Uh, my first impressions, if you will, I didn't necessarily go up and down with a clipboard, but for what it's worth, I did look at my phone, just tracking the amount of time I walked uh, up and down the sideline and wasn't running as quickly as I would in a game setting, but I walked a mile and a half and just about an hour was how long the scrimmage was. Uh, anyone that went to the scrimmage, the really the takeaway was just the tempo, how quickly things ran and how it all kind of felt like a two minute drill. And I think that really raises the stakes, especially when you have so many positions that really aren't decided. And especially that most important one at quarterback, you also don't have a ton of leaders at this point as well. I think that the scrimmage gives an opportunity for guys to start making plays and really start feeling comfortable as a unit. Um, you know, you get seven on sevens, 11 on 11s throughout the week, but it's truncated. It's all kind of separated by individual drills. So to see everyone really move as a unit up and down the field and have to deal with a little more situational ball, I really think you learned a lot. So my impressions on offense, the, the quarterback competition, if you will, um, and a little bit on defense as well, including what I saw really with what they're doing along the defensive line, especially with Angelo Anderson being injured this week. It's already a position group that's thin. It's one that John Summerall has identified as a need. And Patrick Jenkins spent a majority of the time there this weekend. So I'm going to really break down what that means all on today's show. So there's a lot to cover, you know, both sides of the ball, so many position competitions and just a lot of question marks that I'm going to do my best to try to keep this as mentally organized as possible, but just going to start with the offense. Uh, heading into the scrimmage, you know, if you followed practice reports from anyone that's been out there, it has been up-tempo and it's been very tough. And John Summerall's held these guys to a really high standard. I've seen guys pretty much throwing up every single day of practice, uh, particularly along the offensive line in the, um, in the trenches. Um Deshaun Batiste, one of the transfers over from Troy along the defensive line, talked about how he's used to this tempo from being over at Troy, and it's really been helpful for him to kind of be alongside the defensive line and get them going and really just get used to that fast pace. And it's really easy to see how much that makes a difference when I look back at prior scrimmages and, frankly, how Tulane's offense looked a lot of the time last year, where it was a winning offense. It was an efficient one. It was one that was really built around a strong running game. But this one was really fast. Um, they ran about 75 plays, I want to say. And it was about an hour's time. All quarterbacks got two, three, multiple times um, under center. And while we saw quite a bit of running plays throughout the day, it, it really struck me that previous scrimmages were just extremely run heavy and well, you really know what was going on at wide receiver most years, especially at quarterback with Michael Pratt. A lot of the games, uh, including the spring game, there really weren't that many completions. Um, the defense usually won the day, and we've seen how good Tulane's defense has been the last couple of years. Uh, but it's really hard to tell kind of is that the offense as an issue? Is it the defense as an issue? Or are we really just kind of making a lot out of nothing? Um, and this year, it's just completely different where – I'd say the defense started and won th the day being the winning side of the ball, but every single quarterback had really flashing moments, also some bad moments, which I'll kind of get to, but you really just felt like there was so much going on on both sides of the ball. And so many guys got really critical snaps and experience just 
finally playing football as much as you could see. Um, it, it The tackling was pretty hard for it being a scrimmage. And there were a few injuries, but nothing really that severe. And one of them was Yo Keith Brown, who just made this incredible leaping catch in the air. And it was just the way he came down on his shoulder with John Summerall saying afterwards that they think it's probably just an AC sprain. And he would be surprised if we didn't see Yo Keith Brown for the rest of spring camp. But he, he made it pretty clear that, you know, Mario Williams and Yo Keith Brown are really those strong guys at wide receiver. And we've all talked about how much talent there is in that group, but what's really the depth chart looking like at this point? Because you really, again, it wasn't just having Michael Pratt the last couple of seasons. It was having either guys that had, you know, been in that starter role last year or guys that had been around quite a few seasons and were really ready to step up, elevate, assume those starting roles. Uh, you know, Shea Wyatt and Deuce Watts both being on the two and 10 team, I believe uh, Shea Wyatt was on it. I know that the Watts brothers were, um, Jaquan Jackson, but then you have Lawrence Keyes that came on that next year. Chris Brazel had been around for that whole time and had several years getting used to the offense. Um, and there weren't any wide receivers that came over from Troy that would have familiarity with Joe Craddock's offense. So everyone out there is really, it's all just completely new. And these guys under center, you're looking for them to be leaders. You're looking for them to have command of the offense. But as John Summerall pointed out in his post-game comments, if you will, he wants them really to have the playbook mastered to the point where they're able to see what the defense is give, giving them and make calls based on that. I think he really just wants to see someone step up and assume that role. But you could say that about several positions at this point. And that was really the first time I think we saw everyone get their feet wet. So you saw three touchdown drives, if I'm remembering correctly, each quarterback had one, um, two of them being touchdown passes, one of them being a, a run for Kai Horton, although the block he threw on that touchdown really says a lot about the type of guy you've seen Kai Horton really be, but you kind of have the offensive line. I think you can figure it out at this point. Let me get to my, uh, where I had it pulled out. So we saw Trey Tuggle in at left tackle. Uh, we also saw Dominic Stewart, one of the freshmen who John Summerall has pointed out being really impressive for the fact that he should still be in high school right now. And he's switching off at first team offensive tackle because you know, they're still trying to figure out that spot. And he's been very upfront about that tackle role. I think Matt Lombardi has been hurt. And then Rashad Green has been hurt at right tackle. Um, I'm sorry, that's where he was on the right side. He's at offensive tackle. So that's who's starting there. I think you can feel comfortable saying that Vincent Murphy is looking like that starting center with Caleb Thomas backing him up. Um, the last couple of weeks at practice, though, Caleb Thomas has been injured. Him coming back has made, I think, a really big difference in the line as a whole and really being able to evaluate them for their strengths because Josh Remitich was just doubling a lot, having to play that backup center role. And they kind of don't have the depth for you know, a three deep at this point. And so, you know, a lot of these guys are running multiple reps with the ones and the twos. And so when you have a guy missing at one of those backup positions, it just is really hard to kind of not be exhausted all the time. So I thought you saw them really finally kind of move in concert and move as a unit and um R Reggie Brown was someone that stuck out to me as really being someone that I wasn't looking that much at prior and maybe that's just because we haven't seen them really look at that position much um you know Alex Bauman is injured one of the freshmen who plays that position as well got injured in practice last week and so Reggie Brown is kind of that top man and then you saw Josh Goyens Blake Gunter get involved a little bit in the practice but he led in targets um, at the end of the day. He had four targets from multiple quarterbacks, if not all three of them. Uh, and he completed three of those passes and several of them were for pretty deep yards. So seeing him really step up was really fun, especially when you think that Joe Craddock, his offense really is one that favors tight ends. And so seeing another guy step up at that role would really just spell good things for this team. Um, I would be curious, though, even if they didn't hold Yo Keith Brown out for the remainder of the scrimmage, if we really would have seen that many more targets to him, because just as important as the quarterback competition is really figuring out what to do with the wide receiver room. Uh, there's almost too many cooks in the kitchen at this point, and you really want to start kind of figuring out what, you know, your your slot receiver, what your X receiver, your Z receiver, and and who is the first team, second team, third team, that's really all kind of up for grabs at this point. And so John Summerall pointed out 
Mario Williams and Yolkeith Brown as being those kind of primary guys. And then he said there's about three or four guys that are completing to be those other primary players. But then he went so far to go down to the guys that are six, seven, eight, nine, because when you look all the way forward to the season, you look at travel and how many guys are able to take on the team. And so those guys are ones that you know are prepared to step in in a game setting and not really having that all figured out. You can see why I think the target share around the board was very out there um, outside of Reggie Brown and Bryce Bohannon, who I think if we're talking about those, you know, primary guys, him having that many targets on the day and being one of the oldest tenured players on the roster at this point, you know, he was on the two and 10 team. Um, He's been a guy that, he was, he's not necessarily been the star wide receiver, but every time that wide receiver room has gone down, he has stepped up. There was a game last year, if not two, where he was the leading receiver on the day and made critical catches in some of those wins. And you've heard Summerall talk about how a lot of these guys just don't have that much time on task. He doesn't have that much time on task being a starter per se, but he has a lot of time on task being out there, being in a game setting and you look at a lot of the youth on this team and someone like that really might end up making a difference if he can just kind of take that extra step. Um, because the other guys that I think are orbiting around that that primary guy role, and this is just me kind of going off of, frankly, it, it's really hard to say at this point. You know, you have Dante Fleming, you have Shaz Preston, you have Fat Watts, who just the way he moved in that spring game, he's reminded me a lot of the step that his brother Deuce took after that two and 10 year coming into spring camp and, and really just seeing the body type change, you can see that fat Watts has put on, you know, decent amount of muscle, but you really saw him use it in some of the cuts that he made. And he had one of the touchdowns on the day um, from Darian Mensa, but looking at those guys and then probably Therese trainer, Jalen Griffin and Sean Nicholas, you know, that that's a lot of names, but it, it's not really anything that you can say at this point are in some sort of an order and with them all kind of getting targets here and there, and they're not being a starting quarterback per se, it's a little difficult to point to, you know, a definitive moving forward on the roster. But, you know, I just think off the top of my head, Shas Preston has just looked strong. Um, you've seen flashes from Therese trainer and Jalen Griffin, although Therese trainer had two incompletions on his two targets on the day. And again, this is just one scrimmage. What I'm really looking forward to this week in practice is it was something that John Summerall talked about moving into this scrimmage was something you referred to as um, the equip and the engage and equip phase uh, talking about his process of development with us. And he's just been incredibly candid with the media. It's really made this enjoyable and just easy to break down the amount of information that we have and yet don't know just with how forthcoming and thoughtful he's been with us. But you know, he said that you, it, they were in the process of engaging the players, equipping them with the information. And then the next stage is examining them in a scrimmage setting and then evaluating your examination of that. So that's a lot, you know, it's a multi-step process. They're still trying to get guys to understand the scheme, although multiple times after practice, I think it just speaks to the high standard Summerall has. You know, he said that he's been disappointed with people not being up to speed, but the playbook here and there. So I'll be really curious to see what that type of evaluation is after this weekend, because he was candid that, you know, at least with respect to the quarterbacks, all three of them had good moments. All three of them did something that they weren't coached on um, and, and kind of pointed those things out. So it wasn't perfect, but that's really kind of the point of these first scrimmages. But to just think back to yeah, the last scrimmages of the last couple of years, it's just, it's hard to compare because it's a different coach. It's been a different system. You just have had so many guys figured out on both sides of the ball at critical positions at that center and quarterback really being the top uh, of the line there under Willie Fritz, but they were just really run heavy practices. And it was really difficult for any of the quarterbacks, quite honestly, to get a passing game and get a rhythm going. You also had a lot more answers on defense. And something I'm really going to be curious about again is what that evaluation of the cornerback role looks like moving forward. Uh, you know, I wish that I had an all 22 of the scrimmage so I could go back and remember all of these things. It's hard in real time to a know an offense that I'm still getting to know. Um, you could see obvious instances where someone was beat in coverage, but you also saw those players make impressive plays later down the line. But looking back at the secondary for Tulane the last couple of seasons, there's been so much, uh, 
veteran presence there and experience. And I think that that's really contributed perhaps to some of the way the scrimmages have gone in the past. I think you saw some impressive plays from those guys, but there's just, again, there's a lot of questions to be had and you have at least a coach that's very upfront about all those things. Um, The most important thing is going to be who ends up being quarterback. But I think if you continue to ask for that answer prematurely, the only thing that'll do is just give you poor results. And I just don't think that any decisions are going to be made at least until fall camp. Uh, It's just very hard in this spring setting. And you look at the fact that Ty Thompson was hurt the first couple of weeks. Um, He wasn't hurt. He had an off-season procedure on his foot. He was healing from that uh, when asked about kind of what the order was for the scrimmage and what that said about, you know, any of the indicators of a depth chart. Sarah was really quick to dispel that, saying that Ty Thompson, you know, he got the first team reps because he has just not had as much time with those live reps due to getting back from that procedure. And so really just not that much to look into that, getting him really just up to speed with the other guys. But you saw every single quarterback really have that opportunity. And I just don't think it's really worth looking that much into. Um, What I think is worth looking into is that you do have a genuine possibility of a three-man quarterback competition going on. As I've said, this is not the first time that I've covered a quarterback competition. I'm assuming it won't be my last, although I hope that I do have some time off here and there. Um, You in the NFL, you don't have necessarily the spring camp to be able to look at this in such an extended way. And we're not getting invited to Saints scrimmages per se during uh, spring, just because that's, it's just a different way that the NFL works. But having these scrimmages in that spring setting, it, it makes it a little different to look at. And I'm trying to think of what the quarterback situation was for the Saints in the spring of that year and whether or not there was an opportunity to do anything different than roll into fall camp with both Jameis Winston and Taysom Hill really being those only two options. But you looked at their depth chart at that point and they had Trevor Simeon and Ian Book. Um, Ian Book looked good in training camp. I don't know if he would have ever had a chance in the NFL, but he didn't pan out. Um, Trevor Simeon didn't look very impressive in training camp. He had starting experience, but really not that much to show for it. Darian Mensah, I think, is just a little different because all of these guys are pretty unproven at the end of the day. The guy with the most experience is Kai Horton, and that's just the byproduct of Michael Pratt getting hurt a little bit over the last couple of seasons. Uh, but you actually see have seen him step up in critical moments and be able to perform. And so you know that he's able to do that, but what is he able to do during practice, for example? That's something that John Summerall pointed to. There's just so much nuance to being quarterback, and it comes you know both in terms of the traits that you have on the field your ability to be a leader and really master that beyond so you're able to make those checks take what the defense gives you and be able to be a little just very informed and in your own out there we're really seeing that formulate under John Summerall and you know we're still in stage one of this exam phase where you're going to see another scrimmage this weekend and then you're going to get the spring game so making any snap decisions off of the first one would really just not be that wise, but I, I think it's safe to say that you've seen the promise from all of these guys. You've seen where they've had a little bit of weaknesses. The coaching staff's been very uh, upfront about those weaknesses. You have to take into context just how much turnover there's been, but really just what due diligence does for having this competition play out and, and have it be a very healthy one at that. And I think that that's something that really should be highlighted at this point where these are all guys that they've grown up playing this position where you're the most important guy on the field. And a lot of them have that experience in high school, all of them having those records um, and that pedigree, but none of them have really gotten that opportunity in a college setting at this point. And with the most experience coming out of Kai Horton. And so you see really that fire there. And I think it would be very easy for tensions to kind of run high um, when you're all kind of battling for that position. But I think the fact that they've all been so collaborative that it's just been so encouraging and that the vibes have just been really exciting and they all talk about each other in just such a positive manner. I think that more than anything speaks to John Summerall and his coaching staff and the position they put these players in to succeed, but I'm going to try and organize this episode as much best as I can. So I will dive a little deeper now, just into my impressions of the quarterbacks. I, I think that it would be easy to just, 
dismiss, again, Darian Mensah as being a horse in this race. But to do that, I think, would really be a disservice to just what I think competition really means. And that doesn't necessarily just mean lay the best two guys win when there's a third guy involved here who has been making some really good plays as we've seen spring camp go on. You saw all of the quarterbacks both lead a scoring drive and lead a drive that really didn't go that well. You saw the defense win a little bit here and there in between. Uh, again, Ty Thompson was the one who started the day and he completed seven of the 14 passes that he had on the day. He threw for a touchdown to Bryce Bohannon. He had two completions to Bryce Bohannon. He also threw an interception on one of his drives. Um, he started the day with that incredible throw to Yo Keith Brown that ended up with him getting hurt, unfortunately. Then you saw a little bit of Makai Hughes just showing what he can do. And I know scrimmages don't show that much about running backs. We all said that throughout the entirety of it last season, but you can, you're can you just really comfortable knowing that Makai Hughes is there and seeing what Arnold Barnes really looks like this year. You've seen him play in a game setting, so it's different compared to this time last year where we hadn't seen any of these guys at running back play meaningful reps in a game setting. Uh, even Alvite Limited, you saw him out there and you really saw just his power, his burst, and really impressive speed for his size. He's really taken you know the time, I think, to just work on himself, his body this offseason. He's really just trimmed down a little bit. He just looks that much more cut and just moves a little quicker and just has a little bit more burst to start. That's a really good one, two punch to have. So we saw a little bit of running, you know, here and there. Uh, you also saw some moves uh, coming out from the defense where I said they won the day to start off uh, just some really good reads from a lot of the secondary players. And then a lot of good play from Patrick Jenkins. He had a tackle for loss on the one reception that Mario Williams had. He just read that incredibly well. And then Matthew Fobbs white, we saw have a sack to add Ty Thompson's, first series um and then on a scoring drive he just looked really good out there his command really sticks out and it's something that I think you had to see a little more simulated in this type of setting but he just really you could see why the you know draw is there he connected with Shaz Preston on that drive as well as Fat Watts who just like I said the cuts that he was making to get out of coverage it really just looked like he moved different um, than we've seen in the past. And then he connected for a beautiful throw to Bryce Bohan, and it was thrown with really good touch. Um, just really what you want to see. Unfortunately, his following drive that he had was the one that ended in the interception. But you also got to see all the quarterbacks kind of work back from that, except for Kai Horton, whose day ended um, with his uh, interception. Darian Mensah came in next. He went in with the twos, with Kai Horton then coming back in with you know the following series for the ones. He didn't really have that good of a first drive uh, intended for Dante Fleming. There was a pass breakup by Bailey Despaney, who you know we can feel very strong about making some plays back there. Uh, he threw an interception in his second series, but I thought he really improved as the day went on. And that's what you want to see. One of the things I always said about Michael Pratt was what I was most impressed by him was he took care of the football, but the way he responded after he threw interceptions just said a lot about the quarterback that he was. He didn't panic. He didn't try to all of a sudden get cutesy out there or all of a sudden shy away from making reads. You know, he just really went out there and kept playing football. Uh, and that's what you saw Darian Mensah really do uh, in this scrimmage. Then you have Kai Horton come in, who has the most real experience doing this. And so he looks very comfortable out there. What I really liked about his ability was just the tempo with which he moved. It just looked like he was executing a, a two-minute offense, and I'm pretty sure it took less than that. And you think back to the Cotton Bowl, you think back to the, you know those last two drives. The first one was 23 seconds long. You need to be able to do that in critical settings, and they've really treated spring practice as a whole like a critical setting. But it's good to see just quarterbacks operate with tempo and see that command out there. Um, with him just having the most experience, you really want to see him be comfortable and confident out there and, you know, one of his throws was just this beautiful pass to Reggie Brown, who I think just really came along in this uh, spring game. But what I liked the best, my favorite play of Kai Horton's was, I also liked the fact that he was really okay with only throwing one pass on his first series. I think that says a lot about the person that he is, where this is, again, this is a competition. This is them really wanting a chance to show what they can do. And they're really all just team players out there. But he ends up handing off the ball to Arnold old Barnes who just had this incredible run um just burst through there but what impressed me more than anything else was Kai Horton stride for stride through a considerable block on that play that allowed Arnold Barnes to get the touchdown 
Would I like to see that in a game setting? Probably not. I don't want to see the quarterback ever lowering their shoulder per se, but sometimes that's just the nature of the beast of being a competitive person. And seeing that come out in this type of setting is really good to see from Kai Horton. And you could just see how comfortable he was running this offense. Uh, as I said, he ended the day throwing an interception. And with John Summerall saying after the fact, you know, every single quarterback did some things where you can really see their potential and did some things where you could see, you know, their room to grow. Uh, he pointed out that the interception Ty Thompson threw was the wrong read today. Uh, he pointed out that there was another play where the defense was outside, or I'm sorry, they drew the defense offsides. They rolled the pocket and the quarterback ran the other way, not where they're protected. So you're seeing a little bit of those kinks work out here and there. The way you describe Ty Thompson is you really point to his physical traits and you can just see when the picture's clear for him, what he can really do. Kai Horton, he has that experience, but as John Summerall pointed out, you know that he's comfortable there because he's done it the most and he wants to see a little bit more urgency out of him in a practice setting and that Kai Horton knows that. That's where I really think you're needing to see these quarterbacks step up, especially following the scrimmage. Now you've gone out there and played some football, but you need to see some urgency and some leadership and those traits really start to step up and show in a practice setting because I think if not, that's where you're really opening the door for this, you know, three-man race for Darian Mensah. Um, I, I think that it's any quarterback's chance to run and grab with it at this point, even though there's a little bit of an edge to those first two guys. John Summerall described him as an extremely pleasant surprise. He said that he's been very calm, confident, loves to get coached on details, and takes coaching points really well, is actively looking for that feedback. So could that all be, you know, a little bit of coach speak to just kind of give that out there and not give away any of what they're thinking about at quarterback. It's entirely possible, but I think it's very impressive and says just a lot about who John Summerall is as a coach, just as much as it is about, you know, what this quarterback room is, is the fact that he's just not willing to slap down an answer and say that, you know, we have our depth guy kind of settled here because I think that makes every single quarterback out there really want to compete and really be better because they're all basically at the same place in terms of how much time they've taken under center meaningfully as a two-lane quarterback or as a starting quarterback for that matter. With, as I pointed out, Kai Horton has a slight edge in a few games over the last two seasons, but it's not enough to throw out the fact that you have a redshirt freshman on there who's had his moments to shine just as much. So I just, I think especially when you look at the fact that there's not that many starters over the last couple of seasons. You're trying to install an offense with wide receivers that are learning the playbook alongside the quarterback. You're trying to really shore out your offensive line. You have uh, some guys playing on there that don't have that much experience like Dominic Stewart who are, are out there because of injury. And I, I think it would make things a lot easier for the offense as a whole if you were to name a starting quarterback or give one an edge here or there, because you could get used to seeing what quarterback has chemistry with what receivers and answer a lot of those positions a lot quicker. But does that do any service to any of those position groups out there to do that just for the sake of being able to install and move along a little quicker in the spring? I, I just don't see any merit in doing that. And I don't think that you can glean enough information out of these couple of scrimmages that if you were already predisposed to make a decision prior to fall camp, I, I just don't think that it would really matter either way. Um, but I think that you can take at face value that this is a competition that is going to play out. They're not that dissimilar of quarterbacks. They all have kind of been connecting with similar guys here and there, but it also makes the wide receivers have to step up too, because you don't know who the pass is coming from. You don't know, you know really who that guy is going to be, but can you be the guy for multiple guys out there? Um, that's going to be something that I think really will illustrate that room just as much. So there's no need to rush. I think that you've seen the promise in all three of these guys, but you haven't seen any of them have a perfect day yet. And that's probably an elusive thing that you might be looking for. It might never come in my experience covering a quarterback competition. It certainly never came. And it really didn't feel like there was a great time to pull the trigger and make a decision until Jameis Winston had a really strong performance in a pregame setting and I think it was the second to last, if not final pregame game of that year where he was finally named the starting quarterback. Well, you don't have preseason in football, in college football. And you might see this really play out until the end of camp, but 
while it might get, not get named, you really have to kind of have an idea at that point. You also have to have an idea about so many of these different positions. And it says to me a lot about who John Summerall is as a head coach, his confidence in his staff and in and, and these guys to be able to step up is that they're okay rolling through with the fact that there is no guaranteed leaders. There is no guaranteed starters. And that really makes it that much more of a challenge for these guys to step up and stand out. And it just goes to show that nothing's given. Uh, there's really no promises that have been made. There, It just really feels like a completely clean slate. So for first impressions wise, it was really exciting to see all three quarterbacks have that promise, have connections in the air, and really get a sense of what this offense is going to look like for Tulane. The amount of motion, the amount of shifts. Um, it, it, you know, it's not just the one kind of jet sweep play. There are a multitude of guys moving pre-snap, moving to one place, moving to another. It, it's really been exciting to watch the way that they've used the, the running backs out in space, had them go line up in that type of situation. They tried to throw a pass to Arnold Barnes. He dropped it, but we've really seen them set up those plays really well. You saw the linemen, too, get hustle upfield on those plays. I just think this is the best shape that you're going to see a two-lane team in a long time be. And it really showed in the amount of plays that they were able to get off on, on Saturday. So I'll be curious to see what this week of practice looks like for all three of those quarterbacks. I just don't think that you can really say enough about what one performance was versus another, but there's still growth there for all of these guys. But it's exciting because there's also opportunity. And I think what we've seen is the elevation of all of these three guys just making each other better and the wide receivers trying to step up for them as well. You've seen that next man up mentality really be important for Tulane over the last couple of seasons, but it's definitely not any more important ever than it is right now. And that applies just as much to the defensive side, which I'm going to try to unpack as best as I can now. It's easy to hear a promo in the middle of a podcast and think, of course, they like the product they're paid to. Well, if you know me at all, then you know two things. One, I'm truthful almost an opt-in to a fault, and two, if I were in it for the money, I'd be doing something else. So believe me when I say that I love Blue Oak Barbecue. The food, the drinks, the people, the location, yes, all of that. Blue Oak Barbecue has a great selection of your favorites from the smoker, fantastic sides, and awesome bar specials I continue to attest to each and every week. Go check them out. Blue Oak Barbecue, located at 900 North Carrollton here in New Orleans, or visit them online at blueoakbarbecue.com. And I do have those April specials coming for y'all. And since this is coming out Tuesday with my episode on Friday, I'll go through what you guys will have looking forward this week and then give you the rest of the specials on Friday's episode. So you keep it consistent with the red beans and rice on, on Mondays, today, Tuesday, chicken mole, uh, which looks really delicious based on the picture that I'm looking at. Wednesday is a house smoked turkey sandwich. Again, something that looks delicious. Um, any of the meat from Blue Oak Barbecue in any form is just fantastic. You have a big old Blue Oak Baked Barbecue on Thursdays, and I will get you all the rest of the specials on Friday's episode. Ah! Ah! I'll be honest, y'all. It is genuinely hard. Uh, I am a one-man show. I do not have two pairs of eyes. And so trying to follow along with a quarterback competition on one side of the ball, I did my best to follow along with the defense as well. Something I also want to point out too is how crowded the sideline was uh, just filled really with recruits, with people that are involved with the program to the point where it was a little kind of shuffly to try to move around. And this is just a spring practice. There's nothing that I'm doing for my job. So I wasn't trying to you know, run through people and be that extra and dramatic. What I will say is I usually stand behind the defense when I watch games and the way I kind of just fell with, with my watching this last Saturday, I was behind the quarterbacks especially just trying to pay attention to that competition. So I will look a little more at the defense moving forward into next weekend. But what stuck out to me really on the defense that I'm going to break down is what we saw at defensive end in Patrick Jenkins. And just the fact that, like I said before, it's really hard for me to say at this point, if the wide receiver room had looked really impressive just because of the pedigree there, or if you're seeing a little bit of that inexperience at that cornerback role. Uh, we saw Jai Eugene Jr. and Lou Tillery be those starting uh, cornerbacks throughout the day. Caleb Ransaw at that spear anchor role coming over from Troy, and then Jalen Geiger and Bailey Despaney at safety. I, I will say that safety 
you have a little bit of a safety valve uh, there, if you will. Jalen Geiger, just the size of him, continues to stick out. I wrote down in my notes, I, I was trying my best on my phone. It was you know, a little hot out there, so it was hard to see. But I noted that he just flew down from the third level on one of those plays and just blew one up in the backfield. You saw Kevin Adams make a play like that as well. He also had, I believe, one of the interceptions of the day. Um now I'm completely blanking on whether or not he did, but yeah, um, he was also involved in the, in the play that Patrick Jenkins blew up alongside the reverse. Uh, Jack Chinchu was someone that stuck out to me as well. I wrote down that he really made a great tackle in space, and you could safely say that between Jalen Geiger, Jack Chinchu, and Bailey Despaini, that strong and free safety role is really hammered out there, and you can comfortably kind of say that Caleb Bransaw is at that starting role. Uh, for that anchor role, for that spear role. And he spent a decent amount of time there back at Troy. And as just, again, as impressive as we've seen the play at cornerback be, you do continue to hear John Summerall's comments about the amount of youth that's at that role. Uh, when I was doing you know my defensive work for the Scouting Academy, uh, one of the things for defensive back that they had us read was this article about what you don't know about playing cornerback by Richard Sherman, who... Most of his written pieces, I genuinely recommend. He's incredibly insightful. And just the way that he storytells in this one, really, it gave me a lot of insight into the position. And he just starts out with this anecdote that I think says a lot about all of the factors and experience that's required to play that cornerback role. It was a game in Minnesota. It was six below, and he could barely see out of his foggy visor. Uh, he could, the, the way that he knew that the ball was snapped was he felt the receiver in front of him engage and push off. He literally couldn't see out of his visor. So because of that movement, he knew it was a screenplay. He went to go look for the quarterback, but he couldn't see the quarterback at all because of this fog and these shadows on the field and, and the fog in his visor. The only thing that he could see when he looked down was the wide receiver's legs and the purple and white on his socks. He then thinks back to seeing the screen pass a few times on film, was able to calculate in his head based on the timing of when the receiver hit him initially when he recognized that it was a, sc a screen to know when it was coming to him. And he calculated that in his head and at the exact correct moment, based on his timing, hit the wide receiver and knocked it incomplete. And, you know, he points to his instincts and his preparation to both uh, recognize the play and then nail the timing. I think that really is just a microcosm of how difficult and how much experience is required to play at that role. And thinking back to when I had A.J. Hampton, Lance Robinson, Jarius Monroe, all these defensive backs from Tulane on my on before the whistle over the last couple of weeks, I keep thinking back to when A.J. Hampton said that a lot of the time he would almost act as a spy for Lance Robinson and Jarius Monroe on the sideline, looking at the wide receivers, looking at the way they released, and then would go over all of this time that they saw it on film. But you can see as much stuff on film as you want. It really has to, you have to be able to see it in a game setting and something, you know, that um, John Summerall brought up afterwards that I think speaks just as much to the difficulty of it as, as Richard Sherman's comment was, you know, just what does it look like when you're looking at the speed of the game, route recognition, and, and something like split spacing? The guys lined up on the hash, what does that tell you? Versus the divide, what does that tell you? Versus him being on the numbers. It, it's such a technologically difficult position. It's a, that's the reason that, it's considered one of, if not the most difficult position group to start with with the Scouting Academy because it just requires so much terminology and understanding and memories and tendencies and film study. And then can you put that all together on the field? Can you make plays? Uh, it's a lot easier when you've had experience seeing quarterbacks out there where you've seen this wide receiver out there, especially being used to playing them in the conference. And so you don't really have any of that at quarterback. Obviously, guys can always step up. And, you know, we've seen it time and time again at Tulane in a lot of these positions. Michael Pratt is a perfect example at that quarterback position. It's certainly possible, but we'll really have to see how that group kind of moves moving forward. Uh, the linebackers, you really just saw Jixon Agu across from Tyler Grubbs. I thought they really looked strong in the, this game. What I was looking for more than anything was the defensive line and how that was shoring up. Um Angelo Anderson has been hurt. I don't think it's that serious, but edge is really that position that you're missing guys. You're missing Devin Deal. You're missing De uh, Darius Hodges. You're missing Keith Cooper. Um, and, and we saw that group get pretty thin last year to where 
you you had a couple guys playing out of position and being a little exhausted. And it just goes to show how quickly depth on the defensive line can become non-depth at that. But, you know, just really trying to even look at what are we doing here in a, a practice setting. I, I think that you saw the fact that you saw Patrick Jenkins get moved over to uh, that exterior role just says a lot. Um, let me pull up where I had the depth chart for the defense. I'm doing absolutely fine. There's so many notes from this game, guys. Um, totally losing it. So rather than losing my train of thought, I've lost my notes. And we're all just going to do to do like the Jeopardy theme song. Here we go. Um, thank you, everyone. You saw Elijah Champagne and Eric Hicks play those, those interior defensive lineman roles. You saw Adonis Freelu out there as well. What I will note about Adonis Freelu, we haven't seen him much, if any, uh, over the last two years because of injuries. He missed the entirety of the Cotton Bowl year. He went down right before the season started, and I remember that being a very big thing, something they were really looking at heading into the Kansas State game because you lost about 30 pounds on the nearest backup when Adonis Freelu went down. And when you saw him out there in practice, he just has an extra size that, <clears throat> excuse me, if you're looking for a true nose tackle, you really have that in him and in this 3-4 system to be able to anchor that around him. Uh, you saw Matthew Fobbs White start out at the rush end, and then you saw Patrick Jenkins as um, the edge. So it was Patrick Jenkins, Elijah Champagne, Eric Hicks, and Matthew Fobbs White. You saw Michael Lunds come in there a little bit on the edge as well. Um, I, I think that it's safe to say that it's not just a move that they only put out there because Angelo Anderson was hurt. Uh, I've said that the interior of this team is pretty stacked. You have Cam Hamilton, you have Patrick Jenkins, you have Elijah Champagne, you have Adonis Freelu, you have Eric Hicks, and those are all guys that have been on this roster for a long time uh, playing with one another, but you have no one at edge. And you saw Patrick Jenkins actually make some really good plays there. But the way that you have to play that role is just completely different than playing defensive tackle. You know, it's not just oh, let me move this guy a few inches off to the side. Uh, it's the position group that I'm going through in the scouting academy right now. And it is, it's incredibly nuanced, as is every other position. But you know, you're, the key might be different. Um, and I think most guys in college are going off of your man key because uh, a ball key timing is a little harder to look at. But there are some times where you could see the ball snap based on where you're lined up and others where you're just purely relying off the man in front of you. That differs if you're you know, as shaded as a zero tech, as a three tech, five tech, six tech. It just completely changes the way that you, your angles are. Uh, your upfield burst matters a lot more at the edge roll. You know, defensive tackles, they're penetrating vertically, but they're not really expected to burst five yards upfield. It's a lot more of that engaging and attacking a gap. But on the edge, it, it's do you have a pass rush plan? What are your first three steps? Taking an angle, having that speed, having that explosion. Do you start with speed? Can you convert from speed to power? Do you have a counter move? Do you have a pass rush plan at that? You have to be able to corner in the way that you bend your body. Uh, and then just your run responsibilities are completely different. Uh, I, something that I kind of want to get into more on another episode, because I, I think that it really deserves its own conversation of really what's possible of moving that over. And I don't want just want to kind of read off all of these buzzwords, but you're, you're looking at completely different things when it comes to how you're pressuring the quarterback vertically versus pressing on the edge. You're not really looking for a pass rusher, a defensive tackle. You need more of a run disruptor. But Patrick Jenkins has made a lot of sacks. We all know that he had that safety. Uh, but is he able to set the edge at defensive end? And so it's going to be very interesting. And that's something that I really want to spend a little time at that defensive line group over this week's practice, because I think that I've seen, you know, not that I've seen enough of the quarterback competition, but I think it's safe to say, like I said, you've seen the promises, you've seen the highs, you've seen the lows, and you'll get answers as time comes on. But I really do just want to sit down, look at that defensive line group and see, you know, what the consistency is there moving forward. And if Patrick Jenkins ends up staying there, then I think, you know, really having a conversation about what we would have to see him make that type of elevation and that type of jump moving forward. So while you have a lot of experience at defensive line, you could say that you have it at linebacker, although you're missing Jesus Machado, but you have Tyler Grubbs, you have some guys that might be playing a little different position, and that just changes the way that all of them have to play. You have probably some answers at safety and a little bit more experience than you do at cornerback, but 
that's one of the more difficult position groups in terms of the value of experience and that veteran leadership. And now that you're missing all of those guys that were involved in so many of those critical conversations on the sideline this year, it's going to be really you know, difficult on that position group. And I think seeing someone step up and run away with some of their playmaking ability would really spell a lot for them. But all in all, if you're asking me about a first impression for a scrimmage, it was as exciting as I felt in quite a while watching football. And I know that it's been a long time not watching football, but for all of the guys to be able to execute some fun plays on offense, but not to feel as if you know one side definitively won the day, something John Summerall pointed to after the fact, something you really wouldn't be that happy with. I think a lot of the time you do see defense win the day, but you're also seeing that on teams where the experience is there. So with all the inexperience, I think it bred the grounds for quite a healthy competition. And so looking at this week, you know, now they've gone through the in, equip, engage, they had their examination of, of their evaluation, all of those words. Uh, so I'll really be curious to see how that translates this week. And then Friday's episode will be kind of that breakdown heading into what will be a critical second scrimmage for a, a lot of positions on the green wave. But the, the talent is there. The potential is there. And the mentality was certainly there. And you can see how fast this team is really going to run through some teams uh, just from this weekend's report.